what I wanted to study were insects, but I wanted to study them as an anthropologist, not as a biologist. And I was trying to figure out if there was, when I started, I was trying to figure out if there was a way that I could actually, well, I was trying to figure out if I could actually find a way to, to talk about insects and to think about insects as insects. And the only way I could think about how to do that or figure out how to do that was actually by looking at times and places where humans and insects had interesting interactions. Um, so, in fact, it turned out to be a book about encounters between humans and insects, but that wasn't really what I planned when I first started it. I suppose if I had to boil it down, I'd say that insects are especially fascinating in that regard because they have, they create such intense reactions amongst people and so much ambivalence. So we, people have a, we really have a hard time figuring out how to think about them and what they are. They're really very, very, they're just so different from us and they're so unknowable and that's what makes them really interesting. So, so you know, for a long time, people have just have projected onto them so much of their so much of their fears and their desires and their yearnings, and also you know these you know the social insects. So many ideas about about society have been worked out on them and social organization, this kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's it's actually endless. I mean, that's that's sort of what I found. I didn't intend to write such a big book, you know, but it's just it's just endless. And I could have gone on and written another one probably. I don't think they do really, um, except to the extent that we project onto them and they, they reflect it back to us. Um, so they're available, you know, like, I suppose like some movie stars are, you know, to just, just reflect, project, you know, reflect back on us, whatever it is that we want to project onto them. So it's been almost, you know, it's really been almost anything over the, over the centuries. But in terms of what insects themselves are and what they, what they do, I think they're probably entirely indifferent to us. You know, no matter that we really, you know, shape their lives and condition their lives in so many ways, I think they've probably got very little. There's no sign that they have any particular interest in us. You know, that's, that's part of the reason why it's so hard to write about them. But I don't know that we're very good at it. I mean, with the social insects, people have done, done that like crazy, you know, and taken models for human society from them. But with individual insects, it's, it's harder. Um, they really, they really don't, they don't seem to respond to us at all. But there was a time when people didn't feel like that. Um, and I imagine in other places people don't feel like that. So, you know, at the turn of the 20th century, like 100 years ago, um, around that time, it was only around that time that people started thinking of flies as nuisances. Before that, you know, house flies, before that they, they thought of them as friends. And, you know, mothers would encourage their, their children to have flies around them um, as, as like companions. You know, even when they were eating, there was no association of flies with disease until the early part of the 20th century. So at that time, there was a lot of, you know, sort of positive anthropomorphizing of them. I mean, I guess we do it with like, well, in Britain where I'm from, we do it with, with ladybugs, you know. Um, but, you know, it's a little perverse because, you know, what we're supposed to say to them is, you know, this thing, um, ladybird, ladybird, fly away home, your house is on fire, your children, are, your children are gone. Which is, you know, a little, it's not quite, you know, it's not a very friendly thing to say to them, but at the same, at the same time, we really like them, you know. So I guess we do it with some, with some of the pretty ones, maybe. Well, when I first started, started doing this research and writing this book, I didn't, I didn't really know very much about insects. That was actually part of the reason why I wanted to do it. You know, so I'm, I wasn't one of those kids who spent all their time just you know, running around in, in nature. Um, you know, I've always been really a city person. Um, but you know, I'm very curious about things, so I really was very interested in trying to find out something about them. So it was sort of amazing to me to just you know, the, to just discover more and more about, about these, these animals' capacities and actually to start thinking about them as animals because, because people tend not even to think about insects as animals, you know, at least not in, you know, not in the same category as other animals. So, um, so there were just so many, there's just so much that's really amazing about them, about their behavior, about their capacities. I mean, they can, they can do such incredible things. So there was that whole side of it. There was, you know, the way that, um, um, you know, now I'm going blank trying to think of things particular things that are so interesting. About, well, one thing, you know, which I, I talk about in the book is how, um, y you know, that there were these studies done in the 20s, which I think is still, was still being done in the 70s, actually, where um, people tried to figure out how many insects there were in the air. And um, they, they were figuring this out. They were interested in this because 
the, they were trying to track the movements of insect pests, you know, particularly ones that were um, attacking cotton fields in the in the south of the U.S. So they sent planes up to um, they sent planes up to just to try to count. You know, they had these little traps under the wings, and they were they were trying to count the insects. And what they found was that um, there were just these vast numbers of them in the air, and that they were um, they were at really high altitudes too. They were like at ten thousand feet, fifteen thousand feet. And what they figured out over the over the decades, they didn't really think realize it then. At that time, they just thought that they were they'd been sort of wrenched off by the by the air and were just floating around. But what they figured out more recently, probably from the like 50s, 60s, and 70s, was that the insects were actually deliberately getting themselves carried away. Often took off and then found air currents and then were and then were also able to bring themselves down. So even tiny, tiny, tiny insects that that can't actually um, that can't actually fly. Would get themselves up into the air and would would take themselves off places where they'd have you know more of the resources that they wanted or were just in a place that they preferred. And when they first did these studies over Louisiana, they found that in a in a square mile, um, like a column of air, a square mile, um, there were something like between 25 and 35 million insects, depending on the time of day and time of year. So it's a huge, huge amount. And so often think about that, you know, when you look out of the window, that the, the air is just full of these things that you can't see and that they're all going somewhere. And that they sort of, I think many of them, they know where they're going. They're going deliberately. And it's just like this completely, you know, just completely different world that's going on around us that we're almost, you know, most of us are just unaware of. I think what people are surprised about is that um, are the cognitive abilities of social insects. So people know that they have these these very um, well. People tend to think that they have. People know they have very developed social organisation. They tend to think of it as very rigid, and I think that's partly because um, insect social organisation. You know, like particularly bees and ants were, you know, they were used in the they were used during the Cold War to. Um, to be, to, um, as, what's the word, sort of like as an example, no, sort of as, metaphors, as metaphors for, you know, for socialist society or communist society. So they're often being talked about, you know, like worker bees and worker ants and faceless non-individuals, you know, in comparison to, you know, all, all us individuals in the West. Um, so people tend to think of them as very rigid societies and that's actually doesn't seem to be particularly true. Um, bees, Bees, anyway, and I think it's the same with ants. I don't know that much about ants, but but bees are actually very flexible. So although they're in, you know, what what um, biologists often call casts, you know, like the work worker bees and whatever, um, they they're very flexible in terms of the tasks that they do. Very adaptive. So they they actually and they'll they'll change like like many animals do, particularly fish and fish. Um, they'll um, change their they'll change their physical characteristics depending on environmental conditions. So they're, they're really very flexible animals and um, their behavior is also quite flexible. So there seems to be something like 40% of their time which is completely unaccounted for. So they'll spend, they'll be able to, you know, they'll, they'll be doing all the things that we think of as busy bees a lot of the time. But then they'll also be, there's this large, almost half the time when they're just basically just hanging around. Um, nobody's quite sure what they're doing, or at least nobody I've talked to is quite sure what they're doing. They're just in their, in their hives in the dark and they're just sort of like hanging out with each other doing stuff. And it's not quite clear what they're doing. They're doing a lot, they're doing a lot of touching, they're doing a lot of exchanging substances with each other, a lot of social things. But nothing that seems necessarily to have any particular function, just like most of what we do doesn't have any particular function. Um, they're, just, they're just doing stuff or doing nothing. Maybe they're resting or they're just like hanging out with each other. Um, and that, that's the stuff that I think people are less aware of because we have these very strong stereotypes of these rigid societies and this constant activity. And I'm um, not sure that it's quite like that. I have no idea because honestly they're not one of the things that's erotic for me. So um, I don't really have any idea why they are. But I mean for, for some people and um, it's connected to their size, um, probably to the sound and to texture. I mean, all the things that are, you know, I mean, there are other things that are erotic for me that are for those kinds of reasons, but insects don't happen to be them. Um, and so there'll be, so I think it's to do, I mean, in, in the, the, the example you're talking about, which is a chapter in the book, which is about crush freaks, um, who are guys who, basically guys who get off watching women walk on, walk on small things. Um, small things of different kinds. So one of the things that's that's pretty common is insects. 
um, but it can be other, other small things. Um, sometimes it's other small animals, other things. Other, you know, it can be like soft fruit or, you know, depending, you know, these things are really, you know, things that get people excited that it was really, really specific, right? Um, so, but in, in that case, from people I've talked to, and I, I have no idea if this is really the reason or if it's just what it is for those, you know, the people that I talk to, um, it's to do with a, a sort of, um, for these guys, it's just sort of a, a um, projection, I suppose, again, um, where they identify with the position of the insect, something like that. Yeah, though in a, in a very intense way, because it's also about, um, I think it's about death, um, you know, about being in a position of being, of being crushed to death and the excitement of that. Um, so yeah, it's dominance, but it's a sort of extreme form of dominance. But I'll tell you, I'm, I'm actually not that interested in, in why. Um, because I think as soon as you go down that road, you're starting to pathologize people and make out that it's something weird about people. And, um, and I'm really not, not interested in, in doing that. Um, it's, um, to me, I guess what was really interesting about, the, about it was how this is, how it really, um, it ex the, the, the story exposed a lot of hypocrisy in our society because for, um, because during, there was this period, I think, from about 1999 to 2001, um, when crush freaks were really, were really in the news, and period in, I think particularly in, in year 2000, um, crush freaks were really in the news because they were, um, there was a series of court cases where crush videos were being, um, where people who, who possessed or had distributed crush videos were put on trial for, um, in this country for cruelty to animals, in, in Britain for obscenity. And they were, um, and there was a bill that was fast-tracked through Congress to outlaw crush videos and to outlaw, specifically to outlaw the depiction of cruelty to, the depiction of cruelty to animals. And this is the same, the same, um, the same law which, it was actually never used to prosecute crush, crush videos after it was passed, after it was signed. Um, and I should say it was signed just by a claim in the Senate. There was no opposition to it at all. There was some in the House, but none in the Senate. Um, but it's the same bill which is now under review by the Supreme Court um, because it was used to prosecute people who had been, um, who'd had dogfighting videos up online. And it raises, it raised huge freedom of speech issues because it was, it was about, it wasn't about, the, it was equating the depiction of violence with the violence itself. So it was basically saying that if you, if you um, had some representation of violence that was equivalent to the violence itself. You know, this is, as you can imagine, right, this is, this is really a big problem because all the kinds of things, if you, you might want to depict violence for, you know, anti-violent purposes or for you know, any, kind, any kind of reason, any kind of educational, not even educational, there's all kinds of reasons why you might want to um, show it. Um, and so now this is, you know, this is before the Supreme Court at, at the moment. It seems very likely it will be overturned because it's such a poorly written law and so, such a broadly written law. But at the time, it was used to absolutely just, just um, destroy these guys who were um, into crush videos. A very small, really a pretty small number of people. Um, it's, this is a very, you know, very specific and pretty much a minority, minority thing. Um, but it was really used in, in a very aggressive way. There was a large, very high profile campaign against it. Um, and some people that... Um, some people's lives are really, really made miserable, and, and particularly the person who I write about in, in the chapter, who, who, who's um, really a great guy in many ways, I think. Um, he, his life was just made misery for it. So one of the things that he pointed out that I, that I think is, is worth underlining is, is the hypocrisy of this in a, in a society that, that has absolutely no difficulty in, you know, daily slaughtering thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of, of animals for food and for carrying out animal experiments, all these kinds of things, for sanctioning all kinds of, all kinds of violence and cruelty against animals. And his, you know, his issue was that the, um, and, the and I think it's an important one, is, is that, you know, was the problem, the problem with, with crush freaks and crush videos was that, was that the violence that they were committing against animals was in the name of pleasure. And it was that link between violence and pleasure that was so, that was so problematic and so so troubling for um, people in Congress and the people who were involved in the campaign. It wasn't the violence in itself, because all of them participate, and all of us participate in that on a daily basis. 
Well, in both, both of those cases were times when people wanted to do extraordinary, extraordinary and violent things to another group of people. And in order to do that, what they did was try to turn those people into, into objects that you could do things to. So, so really what they did was they, they turned, they turned Tootsies into, into cockroaches and they turned Jews into lice. Um, both of which are, you know, animals that we basically exterminate. So, you know, in, in Rwanda it was through this campaign in, through um, Hutu Power Radio, um, which just repeatedly called, called, um, um, called Tootsies cockroaches in the period leading up to the genocide. In, in Nazi Germany, it was a little different because because there was this because not only were Jews um, called called lice, and they were called many other things as well. They were also called cockroaches, and they were also called um, rats. There's these very famous um, films of Jews being um, compared to rats, and all this fast cutting. Um, but also because they were um, there was this whole structure, sort of infrastructure, of disease control and also fear of disease that was, um, that was called into action against, against Jews. So Jews actually really were um, not just sort of eliminated as, as vermin, but they were eliminated specifically as, as lice. So, and there's, there's all these ironies, so, you know, really sort of horrible ironies, so that, you know, Zyklon B, which was the um, which was the, the gas that was used in, in Auschwitz and um, generally, for ex widely anyway, for, the, um, for extermination in gas chambers, um, was an insecticide. When, when Jews were taken into, Jews and other people, were taken into the, um, into the gas chambers, they were told that they were being taken in for delousing. And, they were, and the rooms they were taken into were disguised as showers, which was, which was one of the first stages of the delousing procedures which people were familiar with. And there, were, there was also a lot, of, a lot of language that was used by um, Nazi leaders in which they talked about delousing, cleansing the country of lice. Um, and this is tied to a, to a history in Germany of, you know, of, of fear of disease, particularly of typhus. Um, and there's the um, creation of border controls, um, delousing stations and border, border controls around the country. And, the, and um, actively delousing and treating people in these very violent ways as they came as they came into the country, particularly when they came in from the east, from um, Russia and, and other parts of Eastern Europe. So a lot of it is to do with language. I mean, language is really important in that process of dehumanizing people. Um, and obviously, I'm not the first person who's pointed this out. Many people have. Um, but in, in Germany as well, it was tied to this, this it, you know, the, it was, it was, in some ways, it was more complicated because it wasn't just just, you know, fitting the label and then the label letting you do something. Um, you know, this, this, the label was really tied into, and maybe it's always like this, I'm not sure, but the, the, the name and the animal was, were really tied into all these fears which already existed and all these, all these activities that existed, um, particularly these things around disease control and fear of disease and fear of parasites. Um, yeah, so it's a complicated and very dark history, but, it, but yeah, insects were very important in that. But they were important really as vermin. I mean, it was, it's the status of insects as, as these animals that you, can, that you can destroy in any way that you want to and that you should destroy and that have no right to live. I mean, these, you know, there, it was a way of, it's, it's a way of um, turning Jews into, you know, lives not worth living was, was the phrase. I don't think fearing them does us much good, but, but I suppose so. In some cases, I don't think cockroaches are to be feared. I mean, there's a lot of ra irrational fear of insects. Um, I don't think clothes moths are, are to be feared either. But, you know, in malarial ar areas, mosquitoes are kind of dangerous, well, they're extremely dangerous. You know, tsetse flies are dangerous. Um, obviously, you know, there's, there's, there's all the disease-carrying insects are really are dangerous. And, you know, if we don't have the... You know, in countries where you don't have the infrastructure to, um, to prevent disease, then those insects are to be feared. But, but they're really to be feared because of, because of poverty. I mean, you know, this used to be, this used to be a malarial area, and, um, but we don't have this problem anymore. 
And, you know, even West Nile disease isn't really a serious problem, and Lyme disease isn't a serious problem um, in, the, in the scheme of things. I mean, it is if you get it, but it's not in the scheme of things. Um, and that's because we're, you know, wealthy countries with, um, well, with now we have much better health, health um, care than we did have, but with health care and with, um, you know, and we, we have the kinds of, you know, the kinds of conditions that mean that we'd, we don't really have to fear insects and we shouldn't do. But in countries where we don't have those, where people don't have those things, then yeah, unfortunately they do have to. There are probably quite a few, yeah, but um, the one that, that I, that, um, that I got to know best was in Japan, or was Japan, yeah, where um, people really have a very, or many people have a very different, very different relationship with insects. Um, and, and insects are much more visible, much more present, and have a much more, po much more positive, positive, or there's a much more positive view of them. You know, when you see insects or forms of insects, you know, so that insects transformed into things in manga and in anime, and people have very strong symbolic associations with certain insects at certain kind, times of year, you know, with fireflies and um, cicadas and crickets and dragonflies. And there's this long literature which, in which they appear with their with these um, strong symbolic connections as well. And a lot of them are very positive. And even when they're collect connected to loss and nostalgia, like um, cicadas are, because they come at, you know, they come at that time of year, um, you know, in the fall, then, um, or should that be, maybe that's crickets that come in the fall. I always get confused. Um, but whichever it is that come in the fall, even though they're, even though they're you know, they're sort of connected with, with sort of loss and the turn of the seasons, it's still, it's still a very, sort of, you know, affectionate relationship and, and, and people who I spend time with feel a lot more um, affinity with insects in general and a lot more, I think, a lot more um, sensitive to, um, yeah, to, the, to, to, their, to their lives, you know, the smallness of their lives and their individuality, even though, I mean, people still, you know, they like crush roaches and all that kind of stuff too. Um, it's not like every, you know, it's not, I don't know what I'm trying to say everybody's like so in touch with nature or something, but there's just a much stronger connection to, to particular insects and they're just much more visible in society in general. I'm not crazy about, um, I'm not crazy about roaches, but other than else, I'm pretty much okay with. Spiders kind of spook me sometimes, but they're so amazing that, um, that I can usually get over that. You know, I don't really dislike it. I try really hard not to. You know, but they, they sort of always take you by surprise, especially, you know, I've, we've got, we're infested with water bugs in our apartment. So, um, so, you know, sometimes come home and switch on the light and there's, there's, you know, two or three water bugs scuttling around the room. And, you know, your first reaction is just to be freaked out. It's hard not to be in that. But then you have to remember, they're really tiny. They don't want to be there. They really don't want to be there. They're there. They're in trouble if they're there. Um, they're, they're probably dying if they're already in your apartment, especially the big ones. And, um... They're really, really scared of you. You know, they just want to get out of the light. But, um, but it's hard. There's some. There's something sort of primal about our response to them, and I don't. I don't really understand it because, because objectively they're really, really fascinating. But even a, even a photograph of them can make you feel queasy. And I'm not sure why that is. I guess it's because, maybe it's because they're parasitic on us in some way. I don't. I don't know. But I really. Don't, I mean, it's cultural, right? And, but. Um, but I don't, yeah, and like everybody else, I don't react very well to them. But I try really hard not to kill them. You know, I just really want them to go away. I try to tell them to go away, you know. But it doesn't always work. Well, don't. <laughs> don't, don't swat a fly and don't smush a spider. You don't need to do that. And just think about how interesting they are. And maybe just look at them. I think, I think we can, I think it, I really do think it enriches our lives to, to, to look at them. And to pay attention to them, not think, not just act as if they're not there in the world, they're not around us. Um, they're really fascinating, fascinating animals. And they're, they're just, yeah, they're just really, really interesting. And paying attention to, to something small and looking at, their, looking at what they're doing and trying to think about what their lives are like and how they're moving through the world, I think, is, is, a, really, um, is a really enriching thing. One, one of the things that, that I've learned from doing this book um, that's really stayed with me is is that we you know we live in our world that is you know the real world to us and that is completely you know we feel, think it's the objective reality that, that we have and it is our objective reality but you know other animals and it's very clear with insects they have a completely different sense of time for instance 
you know, in completely different sense of space. They see the world really differently. Their visual sense of, senses are completely different. Their hearing, if they have it, is completely different. You know, they pick up vibrations, say, and, and we don't really. So, they're, um, so the world they move in is actually, it, it's actually a completely different world. It's not just that they see it differently. It, it is just a completely different world that they're in. So, you know, when we go to spot a fly, unless we've got a fly spotter, you know, you know, and, we're, and we go like this to a fly because, because time moves in a completely different way for a fly. It's very easy for them to get out of the way, apart from the fact their vision so much better, you know, because our, our arm is moving so incredibly slowly. They have endless time, you know, to do that. So, you know, to me this stuff is really interesting. You know, the, the, there are just these, you know, we live in the midst of multiple worlds, really. And the one we're in is the one we're in, and that's the one we live in, but there are endless numbers, I mean, probably an infinite number of them. That, that are also here around us, but we're just not aware of in any way at all. Everything we've, everything we've built and everything, we've, everything we do changes, changes, changes the world for all its inhabitants. You know, our lives are all so entangled right now. You know, we're, you know there's, no, there's not really any separation between us and, us and animals or us and objects. You know, we're all, we're all part of each other now. So, yeah, I don't really know how to answer that except that, you know, they, they, you know, we all condition each other's lives. It's just that we really have the, we have more of an ability to do that than any other, any other being, I suppose. We're just very, very powerful. And one of the things about, about the category of insects is that it's so enormously broad. You know, there are, you know, millions of species and just, you know, billions of individual animals. So, some of them are more adaptive, some of them are very, very sensitive because they have these, you know, incredibly specific um, niches that they live in. And so if, if that's disrupted in some way, then they're just, you know, they're sunk really. But some of them, you know, particularly, you know, the ones that we're really familiar with, like flies and, and roaches, are just phenomenally adaptable. And they've adapted to us. So they've, you know, They've, they've become con companion species to us and they've figured out how to, how to make the most of living with us. And they're, they're probably better, at, or they're obviously way better at living with us than we are living with them because we spend our time trying to get rid of them and they spend their time trying to make the most of us, you know, so... So, yeah, they're pretty adaptable. I think insects are, yeah, astonishingly beautiful. Um, and... There's a, there is a chapter in the book called Beauty, which is um, about, it's very short, um, it's just really just a little story about when um, I used to, you know, as I said, I'm an anthropologist and the first field work I do was in the Amazon, in a village at the mouth of the Amazon. And one day we were coming back on a boat, just like this little, little boat, and, um, and I had no idea it was coming, but the, all the houses along the river, you know, normally they were just these, these small wooden houses. So this sort of a brown color, and they were all just colored like golden yellow, and it was really, it was really trippy. There was, it was like, you know, it's like I don't know what it's like actually. It was very, um, I've never seen anything like it since. Um, and then I could make out, and I asked people, but I could make out that actually it was butterflies, these 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 yellow butterflies that just um, arrive every summer just for a couple of days, and so the whole the whole place just gets completely transformed. It's like thousands and thousands and thousands of them. They come. They're actually attracted to the houses because they're attracted to um, they're attracted to like animal waste and human waste, and that's what they come for. Which isn't isn't quite so romantic, right? But um, but you know the actual what they do to the what they do to their houses is just spectacular, and they just stay for a couple of days and then they go. So that was that was you know that was one of the very dramatic things that um, that I thought of or that um, about beauty. You know, there's also individual insects. That was like a mass, mass beauty, I suppose. But there's also individual insects, and how, how amazing it is just to take the time and really look at them. Even something like a fly is really, really quite amazing if you can look at them. You know, if I find dead insects, I try to save them. You know, I keep them and then look at them under, you know, like under little, the little lens or something. Even with like a pair of glasses, you can look at them. They're just, and really, and it's, it's amazing what you find in New York. I found like little scarab beetles and all kinds of things. Um, and, you know, they're really, really just amazing when you look at them. And to think about, too, because they're just so different. You have no, there's not really any way to, to sort of like access their interior life at all. With most animals, we think that we've got some way of making some connection. But with insects, we don't really, really. We can look at their behavior and sort of speculate, but not really.